2014, and this is the Saturday, the last Sunday, the Humanity Sunday. Okay, so we can start now with the homage to the Buddha. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa So if what is Good morning, everybody. Okay, so we have been studying the sutta called the Chabbi Sodhana Sutta, the sixfold purity or the sixfold cleansing. And this is sutta number 112 in the Madhima Nikaya. And last week we went through the first few sections of the sutta just to recapitulate. The theme of the sutta is how a monk should be investigated or interrogated when he declares what is called anya, which is the word that is translated here as final knowledge. And so the standard way in which the declaration of final knowledge has come down in the suttas is with the declaration that the monk says, I understand that birth is destroyed, or that sounds a little weird, I have to say that, maybe to say that birth is finished. In other words, that the cycle of rebirth is finished, that the brahmacharya, the spiritual life, the holy life, has been fully lived. What had to be done has been done. That is the four tasks regarding the four noble truths, fully understanding the truth of dukkha, abandoning the craving, which is the origin of dukkha, realization of nibbana, the cessation of dukkha, and fully cultivating the path, the way to the end of dukkha. And when one does this, then one can say further that there is no more coming back to any state of being. And so when a monk declares this, the Buddha says that the statement should neither be accepted nor rejected, but instead you should question him. And the Buddha is going to describe various ways to question the monk. The first way that's given in this sutta is by way of what are called the four kinds of expression. That is, one speaks of the seen as it was seen, of the heard as it was heard, in regard to the sense and the cognized, so the monk should be one who is able to say that he abides basically without any attachment and without any repulsion and without any delusion about things seen, heard, sensed, and cognized. Okay, so that is the first section. Then 
even if a monk explains in that way, the Buddha says one should go on with the investigation. Okay. And so one tells him that there are these five aggregates, subject to clinging, then how the monk is one who is truly liberated, then he'll say, he'll speak about how he has seen each of the five aggregates to be feeble, without any substance or essence, fading away and comfortless, and then having seen it in that way, he has reached the destruction, fading away, cessation, giving up and relinquishing of attraction and clinging of mental standpoints, adherence, and underlying tendencies regarding the five aggregates. Okay, then the third section, the monk should question the one declaring final knowledge in terms of the six elements. So the six elements are the four material elements, earth, water, fire, and air. Then the space element, and then finally the consciousness element, which I said should be seen in order to get all the aspects of experience included in the six elements, we should also see the consciousness element as implying the presence of the other mental aggregates, feeling, perception, and volitional activities. And so when the monk is one who has been completely liberated, then he'll declare with regard to each of these elements, again, that he has treated the earth element as not self, with no self based on the earth element. And then with the destruction, fading away, cessation, giving up, relinquishment of attraction and clinging based on the earth element and so forth, he has understood that his mind is liberated. And the same thing is said with regard to each of the other elements. Now, when this declaration is made with regard to each of the elements, if we just take the basic statement in relation to the space element, okay, he says that I have treated, or we could say I have seen, I have approached, uh, perceived the earth element as, non, as not self with no self based on the earth element. We could say that these two statements are briefly stating all four kinds of personality view, identity view, or view of an existing self. If you remember from some of the earlier suttas that we've come across, when the Buddha is fully explaining the nature of identity view, for example, in sutta number 44, where the speaker actually is not the Buddha, but the nun Dhammadina. This is on page 397. This sutta takes the form of a conversation between a, lay de a male lay devotee named Visaka and the bhikkhuni or Buddhist nun Dhammadina. And the lay devotee is asking Dhammadina a number of quite subtle questions about difficult or knotty points of the Dhamma. And here on page 397 in section 7, he asks her, how does identity view, or view of self, come to be? And then Dhammadina explains that the uninstructed, ordinary person who doesn't have any insight into the Dhamma regards material form as self, or self as possessed of material form, 
for material form as in the self, for the self as in material form. And so here we have, and then the same thing is said regarding each of the other five aggregates. So here we have regarding each of the five aggregates or any particular aggregate, we have four ways in which the idea of self is formulated. Either we have direct identification of that aggregate with the self, And so we, if we take, just taking form as the example, or we have possession in which the self is seen to possess, to be the owner. You could say self owns form. The third one is form as in the self. So this is a kind of view that one would have found perhaps being promulgated by some of the thinkers and philosophers of the Upanishads who had the idea that there's a vast, universal, all-encompassing self, which is permanent, changeless, indescribable, and everything with, uh, that belongs to the person exists within this all-embracing self. And then the fourth position is that the self exists in form. So when one takes this position, then one conceives of the self as being something, it could be like an inner soul, an inner witness. And even in the, again, in some of the Upanishads, they speak about the self as being infinitis infinitesimally small but located at the center of the heart. And so in this case, we have the self in form. And also some of the Upanishads speak about five coverings which enfold the self. If I remember, there's the gross covering, which is the covering made, it's called the food the covering made of food. This would be the gross material body. Then there is the pranamaya kosha. This is the covering which is made of, literally of breath or of vitality. So this is the vital component of the material body, which is a subtler layer than the gross material body. Then we have the covering manomaya kosha, the covering or sheath made of mind. This would be, I guess, the um, collection of mental functions. And then subtler still, there is, I think it's called the vijnana, vijnana maya kosha, the covering of consciousness, which is distinguished here from mind. This, I guess, would be the light of awareness. And then the subtlest sheath is the Anandamaya Kosha, called the sheath consisting of bliss. That would be like the subtlest layer of the psychic being. But then even subtler than these five layers or five coverings, there is the innermost core, which is the supreme self. And so the task of the contemplative, of the meditator, is to go through in meditation each of the five sheaths 
and see that the five sheets are not the self. In a way, that sounds a little similar to, <laughs> to Buddhism, except that in the Upanishads, when one breaks the identification with the five sheaths, then one eventually discovers at the core of the five sheaths their innermost essence, which is the Atman, the self, which at the same time is the Brahman, the universal divine reality, which underlies the whole universe and which is the power behind all cosmic processes. I sometimes wonder whether the Buddha used the formulation of the five aggregates as a kind of counterpoint to the Upanishadic theory of the five sheaths. But there's no direct uh, evidence that he appropriated this idea from the Upanishads. But it seems a bit curious that they both use a scheme of five elements of the person. Except that for the Buddha, the view, whereas the, for the Upanishads, the view of the self in form or within the five sheets is the height of wisdom. <laughs> for the Buddha, this is a kind of what's called an identity view or self view, which is adopted by the uninstructed ordinary person, <laughs> the person of the world. Okay, so in regard to the five aggregates, the, the standard formulation, we have these four types of view of self. Okay, and one, we could see that there is a direct identification. So this is form is self. And what is common to the other three views? apart from the fact that they are formulated in terms of the self, what is their common feature that distinguishes them from the first view? Right, that there's some distinction between the self and the aggregate. So the self stands in some relation to the aggregate but it's not identical to the aggregate. And yet, when one formulates or expresses that view of self, one expresses it in terms of the aggregate. Either the, se the self either owns the aggregate, it possesses form, or the, the aggregate form is in the self, or the self exists within form or the other aggregate. And so when we see that these four types of identity view can be actually reduced to two, if you, you want to simplify, you have either the form is the self, or you could say self say, exists that the self exists in some relation to form. So when we look at this particular way of handling the view of self, and then we come back to the sutta on the sixfold purity, then we could see what is really being the intent of the statement in paragraph 8, page 905, that I have treated. I don't really like that translation so much. The verb here is upagachati.
which means to approach, to go to, but I guess it takes on the meaning of, sort of implied meaning, I have considered, looked upon. And so here he says, I have treated, that is, I have looked upon the earth element as not self. So you can see that this is just an alternative way of stating that, or st the rejection of the view that form is self. So it's negation of this view, sort of rejecting it. And then what he says, I have treated no self based on the earth element. Okay, so when he says, I have treated no self based on the earth element, and what he's doing is negating the other three possibilities. So he's negating the possibility that the earth element is either the basis for a self that owns it, or the earth element is inside the self, or the, the earth element is a receptacle, and the self is inside the earth element. And then he makes the same statement with regard to the other, um, the other elements, the water element, the fire element, the air element, and then the space element and the consciousness element. If there's any questions now on what I've just covered, please feel welcome to ask. Please. Self is only for discussion on that is only on this present life, right? It doesn't discuss life after, or does it? Well, I think the idea would be that if there is a self considered either, actually, let's put it this way. If one identifies the self with the material elements, you know, if one says that earth, the, the five material elements here, the earth, water, air, fire, and space elements are the self, that would lean to the view, it's called an annihilationism, because when the body dies, then the material elements break up, and so then one, one would hold that the self perishes and dies at, at death, and that there's no continuation beyond this life. But if one holds the other view, that the self is something distinct from the material elements, or if one holds the view that the self is consciousness, that the consciousness element is the self, then one could hold that this, even though the body breaks up and perishes, but the self remains the same, and it moves on, transmigrates to a future life. And so that will, holding that the self is based on the material elements, or that consciousness element is the self, this will lean towards the view of what's called eternalism, the view that there is a permanent, eternal, unchanging self. Any other questions? Okay, so let's go on now to the next section.
So this is section number nine. Okay, so the Buddha says that if, when an at, uh, if a monk answers in this way, then the monks should applaud his words, but they should still, at least they could still, investigate him further. And they do this by posing the question in terms of the six internal and external sense bases. And there's a little problem in this section. Okay, so let's first read it. Okay, so the question is put to him. Friend, there are these six internal and external bases rightly proclaimed by the blessed one who knows and sees, the accomplished one, the fully enlightened one. What six? They are the eye and forms, the ear and sounds, the nose and odors, the tongue and flavors, the body and tangibles, the mind and mind objects. These, friend, are the six internal and external bases rightly proclaimed by the Blessed One. How do you know, how do you see regarding these six internal and external sense bases? Okay, this much is quite uh, standard. There's nothing unusual or problematic here. So we know that there are, he call these the six ayatanas, which means the six bases for consciousness. And the six bases are divided into two subtypes, subcategories, the internal which are sense faculties, including the mental faculty, and then the external which are their objects. And so we have the eye, the faculty of sight, and visible forms, the ear and sounds, the nose and odors, the tongue and taste, and the body and tactile sensations or tactile objects. So those are the five physical sense faculties and their respective objects. And then we have the mind faculty called the manayatana, or the mind base, which has its own distinct class of objects, which are called by the rather general term dhammas, which here we could render as mental objects or mental phenomena. And so the mind faculty, or the mind base, can take also the objects of the physical senses, because we also you know, conceive and classify and describe with our minds the objects of sight, sound, odors, tastes, and so on. We can recognize them, we can compare them, we can distinguish them, we can conceptualize them. All of that is the work of the mind base. But the mind base also has its own class of objects, purely mental objects, abstract concepts, ideas, mental images, judgments, um, discernments, and so forth. And these are called ayatanas, bases, because when consciousness arises, it always arises based upon a sense faculty, 
and it always takes some object. So consciousness, there's a word that's been used in philosophy to describe this aspect of consciousness, that it's always intentional. And that it always intends an object that is, there's no such thing as a purely, what you might call a pure consciousness, a con at least according to the Buddhist teaching, <laughs> that there's no such thing as a consciousness which is not based upon some sense base inwardly and which does not take some object. Even the most refined meditative states, like the jhanas and the formless meditations, have their own distinctive objects. Though the objects are very, very subtle. But for example, in the base of infinite space, then the object is the infinity of space. In the base of infinite consciousness, then the object is the infinite expanse of consciousness. Okay, so these are the six internal, in, internal and external bases. And then the monks are to us, the one declaring arhatship, how does the Venerable One know, how does he see regarding these six internal and external bases so that his mind is liberated from the asavas through non-clinging? And then if a monk is one whose asavas are truly destroyed or if he's one who has the copy of the sutta folded up, written down on the palm of his hand, so he could glance down when he's being examined. <laughs> then this is the way he'll answer. He'll say, friends, with the destruction, fading away, cessation, giving up and relinquishing of desire, lust, delight, craving, attraction, clinging, and mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying tendencies regarding the I forms, I consciousness, and things cognizable by the mind through I consciousness. I have understood that my mind is liberated. And here there's a little problem. Anybody identify what the problem is? Okay, just go through, we have, the problem isn't with anything with destruction, fading away, cessation, and so on, but it's the object of that. We have the I forms, I consciousness, and things cognizable, let's leave out the phrase by the mind, things cognizable through I consciousness. I have understood that my mind is liberated. mind? No, no. Um, no, the, the problem isn't with the expression, my mind. Suki, stand up and speak boldly. Uh, 
um, things cognizable by uh, eye consciousness, isn't it same as form? Yeah, that seems to be the problem here. That usually in many of the sutta passages which are describing sense perception, we sp they speak about, okay, through the eye, let's see, let me see how it's put. Maybe this comes in the Sangyutta Nikaya more often, but they speak about forms cognizable by the eye. And so it seems that the things cognizable by the eye would be forms, and the things cognizable by the ear would be sounds. Things cognizable by the nose would be odors. So why this differentiation of forms and things cognizable by the eye, things cognizable by the ear? It seems like a redundancy. The commentary, I have a note on this in the back. The commentary goes to some lengths to try to explain how to interpret this, but I have to say the explanations are not very convincing. But I did look at the Chinese counterpart to the sutta, which is Madhyama Agama number 187, and in its counterpart to this section, it just has I, I consciousness, and things to be known by eye consciousness. So it doesn't have that redundancy. So it seems to me that the text should have read regarding the I, maybe we have put it in a different order, the I, I consciousness, and forms cognizable through eye consciousness. And then maybe for the next section, the ear, ear consciousness, and sounds cognizable by ear consciousness. That would make sense. Or another way to take it, if one wants to accept all four as valid, would be, for example, if I'm looking at, say, this little table here, the form would just be the appearance, the color and shape, but the thing cognized by eye consciousness would be the table in its totality. But we don't find texts which, other texts which make the, this distinction. So it seems to me that there's been some error in the way the text has been formulated and handed down, and that we should just see three things here. Okay, so anyway, we have here now the, basically, the statement is showing that the monk who's declaring arhatship is free from all craving, which is summed up in these, which is expressed in terms of a number of similes. Desire is chanda, lust would be raga, delight, nandi, craving is tanha, attraction, I don't remember the words used for attraction here. Could be anuroda. And clinging would be upadhana. And then of mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying tendencies, those could take into account both craving and wrong views, or even taking greed, aversion, and delusion. But in any case, he's saying that his mind is freed from all defilements regarding the objects of perception, regarding the sense faculties, and regarding the consciousness. Okay, any question on this section? Okay, then we go on to the next section. This is section number 11. Okay, so now, again, 
if the monk answers in this way, his brother monks should appreciate his statement, but again, they can question him further. And now comes the question, how does the Venerable One know? How do you see? So that in regard to this body, with its consciousness and all external signs, that sounds, I have to say, sounds a little strange. I, I've changed my translation of this to objects, because external signs would be like you coming up Guangyan Monastery, you'll see sign parking lot, sign this way to the Great Buddha Hall, this way to Kuan Yin Hall, this way to the dining hall, or driving out on the street, um, <laughs> speed limit, 50 miles per hour. <laughs> it doesn't mean signs in that sense, but this, the word here is nimitta, which can be translated object. So it's referring to this body with its consciousness. So here we have all the material components of existence sort of summed up in the body, and then all of the subjective or mental aspects of experience summed up simply with the word consciousness. And then all of the objects of experience comprised by the expression external signs, I think it's bahida ni mitani. Okay, so in regard to all of this, eye making, mind making, and the underlying tendency to conceit have been eradicated. These are the three important terms. Yeah, one thing I should say about this compound, you see, Pali is, they call it an agglutinative language in that you could, I used this expression yesterday, that you could glue words together to form long compounds. And so this is a long compound, ahankara, mamankara, mananusaya. And it's a little bit, because it forms a compound, it's a little bit, unclear whether the last word, anusia, underlying tendency, should be taken only in relation to conceit, or whether it should be taken in relation to all three of them. I'm inclined actually to take it in relation to all three of them, so that we have underlying tendencies to eye-making, mind-making, and conceit. And these three terms are connected with the activities of three particular types of mental defilements. Eye-making 
is generally sort of connected or explained to result in a view of a substantial self, some kind of metaphysical self, or some kind of persisting ego entity behind the process of experience. So also, since conceit revolves around the concept of I, we could also say I-making also leads into conceit. So the two are not necessarily mutually exclusive. So we could also, I would also put I-making as a basis for view of self and conceit. But maybe because conceit also plays a very prominent part in our mental life, so the Buddha has made it here a separate factor amongst these three. Okay, and then the second one is called mamankara, which means making mine, making things mine. And this is connected with the activity of craving. Because craving is, you could say, it's a drive not only to enjoy, to find delight in the objects of the senses, but it also has a possessive tendency. The, it's sort of the basis the basis upon which we um, grasp things and appropriate, appropriate them, take them to be possession of myself. And so if you could say that through eye-making, we create the sense of an inner self, and then through mind-making, we reach outwardly and grasp hold of things and take them to be mine, not yours. You know, like we have all of these labels. This is the property of Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. Anybody who takes this will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. <laughs> And then what's interesting is that these expressions, ahankara, mamankara, imply or suggest that the I and mind are things which are made or fabricated. You know, that they're not realities existing in their own, in their own right, but they are the products of mental construction, the constructive activity of the mind. So we construct the idea, even at very subtle levels, we construct the idea of an inner I, an inner self, and then we construct the idea of something belonging to me, being mine. You know, like this recorder, in itself, it doesn't have any intrinsic belongingness to Bhikkhu Bodhi. It just is a collection of different electronic parts put together, sitting on the table with the function of recording. But <laughs> because of my mental activity, well, of course, somebody gave it to me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but then I project the idea that it's mine. In fact, I had a very interesting experience with this, I think it was this very recorder. This was 2009. This was interesting. <laughs> I went to, I was invited to go to Copenhagen when they were having the conference. This was the climate conference in Copenhagen. This was the UN. You know, every year they have this climate conference, which always fizzles out and nothing is accomplished. But that year they had like a, a spiritual organization based in New York, invited you know, so, uh, spiritual people, religious people from different faiths, 
and backgrounds to come to Copenhagen to have a kind of alongside the UN conference to have a spiritual conference on changing or reducing climate change or stopping climate change. And so I was there and I had my tape recorder, this recorder, and I was on one of the panel discussions and then right after the panel discussion was lunchtime but somebody pulled me aside when I came off the, out from the panel and was speaking to me. Then I went back to the place where I put my recorder, and the recorder was, the recorder was there, and so I took it, and because I, I bought it because I wanted to record my presentation. And then, okay, we went through the rest of the conference, then I came back to New York, and I played it, and it was not mine. It was in, <laughs> everything was in French. <laughs> and I was wondering, how did this happen? This is my recorder, but it's speaking French, and my talk isn't on there, and all the other things that I recorded you know, previously, not there, but just a whole bunch of recordings in French. So fortunately, I, well, I contacted the organizer of the conference, and fortunately they found that there was somebody from France who also participated in our conference group, and they had her contact information, and I contacted her, and she said that she had picked up a recorder, a recorder <laughs> and it didn't have her talks, <laughs> but somebody giving lectures in English. And so we sent our recorders from one to the other, and I got my recorder back. So you see, the, all the time I was thinking, this is my recorder. <laughs> Why is it speaking in French? But in fact, awakening came, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> now if I could get that idea, not mine, in regard to everything, including this body with its consciousness and all external signs, then I'm liberated. <laughs> okay, so now they ask, the monks ask, how is it that in regard to this body and consciousness and all external signs, you have eradicated eye-making, mind-making? Oh, I didn't explain conceit yet. Okay, conceit is the third factor involved here. And I, I wrote on the board, conceit revolves around what I call the inflated sense of I. But this sense of I moves in a different direction from the formulation of a view. This, the sense of conceit arises when one takes the idea of I and uses it to build up one's sense of we say self-worth, prestige, sense of, sometimes it's said that this conceit can work in three ways because one is measuring through conceit, one is measuring oneself against others and so one can conceive oneself as being either superior to others that's the connotation of the word conceit, the usual connotation in English that one is superior to others. But in the Buddha's explanation, there are three aspects. Apart from the superiority conceit, there is the conceit of being just as good as others. You know, just like my mother used to tell me when I was a kid, because <laughs> I was quite short when I was a kid, and all of the big kids sometimes would make fun of me, so my mother would say, don't worry, you're just as good as they are. So then you feel happy because you know that you're as good as others. And then comes the third kind of conceit. This is what we call the omana in Pali, with an O in front of it. 
which is that prefix O indicates going down. So this is the inferiority conceit. Sometimes it's also explained as hino asmi mana, the conceit that I am inferior to others. So there's the seo hamasmi, that's I am superior to others. Sadiso hamasmi, I am equal to others. And hino asmi mana, I am inferior to others. Because even when you think, oh, I'm not as good as anybody else, that's not real humility, but that's a subtle kind of clinging to the notion of I. Real humility is you don't have any sense, well, it doesn't have to be the selflessness of an arhat, but real humility means that one just doesn't compare oneself with others, but one accepts one's own say, one's own portion of talents, abilities, skills, beauty, um, strength, and so forth, just as they are. Maybe trying to improve, of course, but not using this as a basis for ranking oneself, putting oneself in the ranking order in relation to others. Okay, so now the monks ask the monk who's claiming final knowledge how he has eradicated eye-making, mind-making, and the underlying tendency to conceit. And this question comes up, this is an interesting point, in a number of other suttas, particularly in the Sangyutta Nikaya, one sees there might be about eight or nine or even ten suttas in which this question is raised, particularly in the chapter 22, the connected sayings, connected discourses on the five aggregates. And invariably, or at least most often, the answer is whatever material form there is, internal or external, or whatever material form there is, past, present, or future, internal or external, high or low, inferior or superior, far or near, one sees all material form as it really is. This is not mine, this is not I, this is not myself. And then the same is repeated for the other four aggregates. So that is the answer that one finds repeatedly in the Sangyutta Nikaya. For example, chapter 22, there are several suttas in the 60s, might be 63, 64, which give that answer, or it could be 69, 70, I'm not sure exactly. But if you look around in the 60s, in, the Sangyut, in chapter 22 of the Sangyutta Nikaya, you'll find that answer. But here we have a different presentation. Maybe this presentation is used because this particular sequence is quite typical or quite a standard in the Majjhima Nikaya. So the monk here is going to explain in terms of the full, what is called the sequential training. So he starts off by saying that in the past, when I lived the home life, I was ignorant. Then the Tathagata, that's the Buddha, or his disciple taught me the Dharma. On hearing the Dharma, I gained faith in the Tathagata. Possessing that faith, I reflected upon the unsatisfactory nature of the household life. Then I went forth from the home life into homelessness. Then having gone forth, I took up the the precepts and the way of livelihood, the way of training of a bhikkhu. And then we have all of the intermediate stages of training here, which you'll find in Sutra 51. We don't have to go through them again. 
up to the stage of purifying the mind of the five, uh, five hindrances. And then he continues that having thus abandoned these five hindrances, the defilements of the mind that weaken wisdom, then secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome mental states, I entered and dwelt in the first jhana, then in sequence I entered the second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. But then there's a little difference from the standard sequence that we find elsewhere in the Machimanikaya. Here he says directly, when my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, and so on and so on, I directed it to knowledge of the destruction of the asapas. Now, where we find the sequence elsewhere in the Machimanikaya, then we have what are called the Te Vija, that is the three higher knowledges. That is the passage on using the concentrated mind to arouse knowledge or understanding begins with the recollection of previous lives. For example, we find this in Sutta number 27. Well, we find it in the Buddha's description of his own development in Majjhima Sutta number four. Then we find it in the description of the disciples progress Sutta number 27, Sutta number 39, Sutta number 51, also I think in Sutta number 70, 73, and perhaps some other suttas. But here, okay, th then from the recollection of past lives, then we come to the arising of the divine eye, which is the ability to perceive, directly perceive, the passing away and rebirth of other beings, and to see how beings move from life to life in accordance with their karma. Then in the third place comes the knowledge of the destruction of the asavas. But in this sutta, the exposition moves directly into the knowledge of the destruction of the asavas. Then the commentary explains that those first two types of knowledge, recollection of past lives and the divine eye, are omitted here because the monk is trying to answer the question how he knows that his mind is liberated from the asavas, from the taints. And then the knowledge of past lives and the divine eye are not really essential for developing, for acquiring that knowledge. 